Okay, guys. Uh, so since we are a little familiar with uh, creating an API, a REST API using um, AWS Lambda functions, uh, we'll dig in a little more and let's see how to um, do a little complex stuff with AWS Lambda. Uh, so this in this one, I'm actually what I'm going to do is uh, let me show you an uh, sample application that I just created to demonstrate this. So here. Uh, we have a simple front end which actually searches for a word and gives us uh, the synonyms for that word. Um, so to do this I actually used uh, some Oxford Dictionary uh, developer API with uh, secret keys and app keys provided by them. Um, so one problem with calling um, the external API is using secret keys directly from the front-end application is that you are actually exposing the secret keys to the user itself, uh, which is a less secure way and it, which is not recommended. So uh, in this session, we are actually going to use a Lambda function to um, encapsulate the secret keys from the user and still make the API calls happen. Um, Okay, uh, so I'll, I'm just going to show you how to, um, so here, okay. So here I actually have the front end application. Uh, it's a simple application created with Vue.js and um, yeah, built with yarn and parcel, of course. Uh, so what this does is uh, whenever you input something, and uh, let's say you press search, it sends an API call to, to our Lambda function, and then uh, the Lambda function calls uh, the developer API of the Oxford uh, dictionary uh, through that Lambda instance and then returns the re response back to the front end. Um, to show you how it's done, we'll see the source of the Lambda function. I have it here. Uh, so here you can see I have uh, imported Axios, a library to get um, uh, to make uh, network calls, get, res get requests and all. And then I have a sample response JSON. Uh, this is the JSON that I'm talking about. And uh, then, then I have two function definitions. These are actually local function definitions which are used only within uh, the lambda, uh, this Lambda function and which are not exposed to the outside. And then you have the familiar exports.handler function, which is the function which is triggered from the external API call. So here you have, uh, you can see here I have uh, queried the uh, query string parameter, the word. And if it's not defined, it defaults to syscollapse, right? So the word becomes syscollapse and the uh, rest, rest, rest of the function continues. So I initialize the response with a null value. And if the word uh, has this is collapse, uh, I'm sending a definition, a my own definition to the user. And if not, we are going to call the real API. Um, like this. So I have here hard coded the app ID and the app key here just um, for the sake of easiness, but what you should usually, usually do is like um, save it somewhere else as a configuration and use it directly from here. Um, and here you can see I'm using Axios, which I imported from here to do the uh, to perform the get request uh, with the URL of my uh, external API. And you can see I'm setting the headers here. Um, 
headers, they're, they're actually going to be this app ID and the app key. They need to be uh, in the headers for the authorization with this API call. And then I get the res response as a callback, as a promise actually. Uh, after this uh, request is completed, I get the response of the URL uh, from the endpoint. And I, what I do here is I'm just modifying the response that I need to send and setting the status code and uh, allowing cross origins. Like I said before in the previous example, to enable a course, cross origin request. Um, and here in the body, I'm just sending back to the user the data within the response itself. So this resolve and the promise, you can see uh, these are used to uh, enable async, asynchronous uh, functions work. Uh, you can dig into that a little later, it's out of the scope for the tutorial, so I'm not going to dig into that right now. Uh, however, here, uh, what, uh, so basically the whole flow is complete now. Just whenever an event occurs, it gets the query string parameter of the, uh, the word. And then if uh, I'm just getting the response from the API and then uh, sending it back to the user, returning it back to the user. Um, so a few things to note in here is that if I'm using the console, the Lambda console, here I can I cannot um, do uh, I cannot uh, do like npm installs or um, fetching data fetching within this environment because it's just a code editor. But if we want to import external modules like Axios or Load Dash or, or some other uh, external npm modules, what we can do is um, we can uh, actually in install it locally. Let's say I'm just uh, adding Lodash. I'm not using it uh, in this, but still I'm um, just going to show you how it's done. So what we can do is just um, install this locally. Uh, and when it comes to, um, so I installed it in a different location, but uh, get the idea, right? So it's um, so if um, if you install it locally and then you have these modules, all, all the modules here, um, what we can do is we can uh, select the, all the folders which you have here in the source of the file, including the node modules folder, the index.js folder, and the uh, response.json that I created, uh, which is referred here. So what you usually do is you select, you compress it in a zip file. And then you can upload this file itself. So it contains all the node modules that are required by uh, the Lambda function you need. So things like that um, can be made possible. Uh, and another thing to note is that uh, this uh, zip file should be less than 75 megabytes, if I remember correctly. Uh, so there are some limitations like that to note. Um, so, Basically, that's it. Uh, and a few notes to mention uh, on using Lambda. Lambda. Uh, so these Lambda functions should be stateless. So any uh, state which needs to be persisted should be saved into Amazon or similar uh, persistent service which is uh, available to the internet. And uh, also, just like an EC2 function, uh, just like in situ instances, these Lambda instances also have access to threads, processes, and environment variables, um, uh, which are available in an OS. And also, uh, uh, the non-persistent disk space, uh, it means the temporary directory has uh, around 500 MB to be used within the Lambda function. And 
the, uh, these lambda functions uh, are um, created in a machine with uh, usually starts from 128 megabytes and uh, we, it can be increased and it can be optimized using uh, the max memory used uh, which is shown here. Here we have the memory size is 128 MB and the memory used is 19 MB for this simple function. Uh, it might vary and if it it's reaching um, the maximum memory we have the memory we have we have to uh, increase the memory of the lambda form, lambda instance um, and and also uh, yeah, by default the concurrency of this lambda function is set to 1000 however if um, it can be changed and if this lambda instance is kept uh, spawning, uh, it might cost you a function. So uh, if something goes wrong, you can uh, use this throttle function, the throttle button, uh, which throttles, uh, which stops uh, the lambda functions from being uh, triggered, uh, moving, moving forward. Um, and like we did in this uh, example, if we are using this, uh, in several origins, for example, this one is using this application is in a local host environment, and this one is calling this uh, external API. It needs to be uh, it needs to have uh, cross origin requests enabled. So in that case, we have to add these headers, which I showed you here, like this. So in the response, uh, and also the response. Uh, should and it must have this status code, the body. Uh, otherwise, uh, if it's an API call, it uh, returns up an error. Um, so basically, that's a few pointers. If uh, if you come up while you develop uh, Lambda functions, um, that's that's more like it. So I think you had some idea on how to create a simple Lambda function and how to extend it to be useful in your day-to-day -day applications.